What's going on, man? It's your boy, Jay Holly, and we are back with another episode of Believe in the Cowboys on the Believe Network. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it on Spotify. You can find it on Apple, all the places where you get your sports podcast goods. So make sure that you lock in. Uh, don't meet me there. Beat me there each and every week. But before we get started, I uh, got to read a little something from my boys over at Bet Online, the world's most trusted betting platform for your number one source for everything football. Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, even live odds and spreads that can bet on during the games. You think that uh, you think you know your stuff? Get into the $2,000 mega contest and pick five games against the spread each week for your chance to win a prize and a share of $200,000. When the game is over, head on over to online, head on over to our online casino and get into the game on blackjack or a game of poker or unwind with one of over the 150 slot games. Head to the website today and get into the action. Bet online, the game starts here. And for the Cowboys, the game started really at 3.30 Central Time, 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. But it started a little bit before that, too. Because uh, prior to the game starting, the 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 organization, the Dallas Cowboys, Jerry Jones, Stephen Jones, and the Jones family, they came to agreement with Todd French and Dak Prescott on a record-breaking contract, making Dak Prescott the highest paid quarterback in the National Football League, uh, a four-year deal worth $260 million, 91% of that contract guaranteed, $231 million of that contract is guaranteed, has the largest signing bonus in NFL history at a whopping $80 million to sign his name, an average of $60 million per year. I mean... <laughs> It was always going to happen this way. It was never not a chance that it wasn't going to happen this way. And Jerry and the Joneses and the Cowboys organization, they like to play these negotiating games. They wanted to play these, these wait and see games, but it was always supposed to be this way. It was going to be this way from the last contract that he had, because when you look at it, Dak was on Dak is on par was on par to make fifty five million dollars this year, and the cap pit that would have taken next year would have been egregious. He would have walked away, and you'd have still had forty million dollars of dead money that you had to pay out. And so the Joneses, Jerry and Stephen, it was already in the plans that when we got to this point, that there was going to be an extension done for Dak Prescott. Because there was just too much money that you just couldn't afford to have to pay out and not have the player. And you absolutely, you had zero leverage. You had a big, fat goose egg. Uh, I mean, an ostrich egg. You can pick the, pick the bird with the largest eggs. That's what they had. Because you had no franchise clause, no trade clause, and you don't have a quarterback on a roster next year either that's under contract. Trey Lance is done. So is uh, Cooper Rush. And when you look at how football is played in 2024, you don't have a quarterback. You don't have a chance. Ask the Giants. I I'm not taking shots. I'm not taking shots at the Giants. You don't have a quarterback. You do not have a chance. And even though there's only 32 of these jobs available in the National Football League, the really good ones, the really, really, really good ones are only eight to ten of them. I always say put Patrick Mahomes in his own stratosphere. We, we don't put anybody in the stratosphere of Patrick Mahomes. He sits high above. I call him the mulatto Jesus. Uh, and I say that because Reggie Miller back in the day called Michael Jordan the black Jesus. And he, they had that in the, in the NBA. And I think for the NFL, you just take you take the mixed mulatto Patrick Mahomes and you just make him the mulatto Jesus. You put him way up high. Like he's, he's, he's the alpha and the omega of this thing when it comes to quarterback play in this league. And that tier is a God tier. And then there's other tiers that fall underneath that. And while Dak and anyone else is not in the God tier, if there's a second and third tier, 
you can you can find where you want to put him in that tier. But it's only about six or seven or eight other people who bo- who go in those two tiers. So the Cowboys had no choice. And they made right with Dak. They made right with uh with CD Lamb. And and the only the only pushback that I would have with it, because I knew it was gonna happen, um, is why'd you wait? And and here you can have your conspiracy theory or you can be a conspiracy theorist because with signing Dak, you essentially just freed up $40 million of cap space. Now this could play two ways. This could be Jerry Jones and the Jones just looking towards the future and understanding that this roster is littered. And I, I'll go back and do the numbers and maybe come back to you later on this week. But this roster is littered with players who are on the last year of their deals. Like littered with it. So maybe he's saying, I need to free up some money so I can sign some guys next year. But I also look at it and I go, man, if you talked about going all in and, and we, we we don't want to you know, find ourselves in the path, past, but if you had done these deals, like we all knew that you were going, if you were around this organization, if you, if you cover this organization day to day in the building, I'm in the building, I'm around this organization every single day. You knew CD was getting his, his check. You knew Dak was getting his check. But boy, if you'd have $40 million headed into free agency, maybe you could have secured some of these spots or added some more significant pieces to put your team over the top. Maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't want the responsibility of people saying, hey, you made those two deals. Now you got 40 million, and the pressure from the outside says now you got to go and sign some big time free agents. But nonetheless, the deal was done, and the Cowboys got to playing some real live football. And coming into this game against the Cleveland Browns, there were a lot of questions. You look at what the Cleveland Browns were last year at home. They were the number one ranked defense at home in a lot of categories, third down, uh, uh, you know, uh, rushing against them, passing against them. They averaged 30 points a game. They were a different team on the road. It was literally Jekyll and Hyde with these two teams, with, with this team on the road and at home. But at home, they were really, really, really good last year. And outside of the Cowboys playing the Giants in the opener, because uh, they're 6-1 and one against the Giants when they open up the season with them, the Cowboys had not won a game against anyone else. So you start factoring all these things in and you think about, boy, we have a young left tackle, we have a young center, and this defensive front, you have the reigning defensive player of the year, Miles Garrett, and, and, and they're, 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 it's easy to, to see that there can be some concerns and what could possibly happen in this football game. And as the game begins, if you watch the game, the first, the first play, is, it's a penalty. And then the very next play, if I gave you a guess, if you went to bet online and can do a, a pick, who would be the first player on the Cowboys offensive line to give up a sack? I think that Zach Martin would be the last guy that you pick. But football is a strange lady. And the first play is a penalty. The second play Zach Martin, and I wouldn't say he got beat off a block. Dak held the ball for a very long time, whatever. Zach probably thought he was already, the ball was already gone. But nonetheless, um, he gives up on his block. And uh, I think it was Tomlinson. I think he he almost buried Dak. Like he literally almost put Dak through the. Through the he might have put, like, if it, if, if it wasn't September and 65 degrees, if it was like November, where the ground has gotten real hard, real cold, that would have been out because the way he hit the ground and his head hit the ground, the, see that that grass is still good grass. It's still soft. It's still got a little bit of give to it, a little sponginess to it because it's fresh grass. It's the opening week of the season. Boy, had that been no late November, that could have got real ugly. But nonetheless, it's always um, a good friend of mine and, and the guy who I work with do the pre and post game show with uh, Sky Walker. He, he tagged going up this offensive line, going up against this Brown defensive line with basically survive 95. Survive 95. 95 is Miles Garrett, the reigning defensive player of the year. And those type of players, while you can't stop them, you can contain them. You can, you can get those guys off their game. And for the most part, I, I'll say that Tyler Guyton did okay. 
wasn't bad. Had some things that he probably want to improve on. But overall, wasn't, excuse me, wasn't bad. I do have to give flowers and credit to Mike Solari, the offensive line coach, Mike McCarthy, the head coach and the play caller, and, and, and Brian Schottenheimer, the game coordinator, whatever the heck he is, because they gave these young players a chance. They didn't just, they didn't Chaz Green him. They didn't line him up out there and just say, hey, good luck. <laughs> you know they they didn't they they didn't roll them out there and, and, and say hey find your way back home. They chipped. They put a tight end over there. Uh, they rolled away from him. They threw the ball quickly. They allowed the young fella to battle, but not to be beaten. They allowed him to 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 lock horns, but not have his head knocked off. By doing what they did. And, and that's commendable because you don't want to lose a young guy in week one. You don't want confidence crushed in week one. You don't want to look up and you say, dang, he gave up three, four sacks in week one. That can crush a kid's confidence. And yes, he gave up the strip sack fumble. But for the most part, Tyler Guyton battled. He really did. Cooper BB battled. You didn't see the pressure coming up the middle. Um, the, the saving grace for Cooper BBs or they ran that four, three and the way that they line up their, their tackles, they line them up over the guards. So Cooper BB didn't have that, um, didn't have that bear look sitting over top of him, um, down in and down out, but offensively they were okay. You saw CD lamb make some plays. He and Dak had a few connections. Um, quick side note, Jake Ferguson, uh, Ferg went down in that game. It looked way worse than it really was. Um, reports are that it may be like a bone bruise or a knee sprain. Uh, but the possibility of him playing this Sunday, it didn't look that way on the field and when he was walking off. But the possibility, they could this could be the Cowboys playing coy, but the possibility of him playing this Sunday versus the Saints is still an, uh, a possibility. He, they haven't ruled him out. Uh, I'm sure he's going to get a treatment around the clock today, tomorrow, and we get get you know get get himself together, maybe get a walkthrough or something like that. In but uh, that was a that was a uh, something that was encouraging to come out of that game. That for it wasn't an ACL, it wasn't anything like that where you know MCL would put him out for weeks at a time. But offensively, they were okay. S still not a fan of the 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 running back by committee. Um, that's going to have to, they're going to have to figure that out. I, I don't think that's a, a realistic thing that they could do, um, this year. I just don't, I, I just don't think so. Uh, but nonetheless, over a hundred total yards between a plethora of back CD lamb got some carries back there as well. Dak played. Okay. He, it, he wasn't at his best. He wasn't as sharp. He had some good moments. He had some good throws. But, you know, these are the type of things. And, and there are a lot of people who sit on both sides of the fence when it comes to should guys play in the preseason, should guys not play in the preseason. As a former player, I just think rhythmic-wise, cohesion-wise, getting out there, getting some of those live bullets get going, man. Like Because the intensity, the adrenaline, it flows at a different tick when you're playing with live bullets. It just does. In practice, he knows no one can touch him. He knows that, yeah, what could be a sack, he just kind of just shrugs off and still completes the ball down the field. No one hits his arm, pulls his jersey, is around his feet. No one does that in practice. So to get those live reps, even, even when they do things with uh, you know other teams, the quarterbacks are still off limits. So he was okay. And, and, I, and I, Now, this is not an indictment on Dak. I think he's going to be just fine. Um, but offensively, they were okay. They did enough uh, to go out there and secure the game, secure the game. But the story of this game, yes, the contract is great. Yes, the win is fantastic. The story of this game, the Cowboys defeating the Browns, is about the defense. It, it is about the defense. 
You saw some stars be born. You saw some guys who were, if we're using, if we're using the baby references, you saw some guys who were in the incubator for a year and finally got out the, the Nick U and hit the ground running. The name that stands out to me the most, yes, Micah Parsons. You're going to talk about Micah Parsons, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to disregard or disparage Micah Parsons because he is the spoon that stirs this Mike Zimmer's defensive coffee. Period. He is. He is the X factor. He is the one that. He's probably the only one that can create the kind of havoc by himself. No games, no picks, no nothing. He could just line up and just wreck you. And he had some moments in that game. He should have had four sacks. Uh, he ended this game with four tackles, one sack, one tackle for loss, five quarterback hits. He should have had four sacks because he had Deshaun Watson in his grasp several times. And Deshaun, who's a powerful, slippery quarterback, um, slipped out of, of his grasp and, and made plays to, to alleviate and to avoid the sack. But the bright lights and the story of this game, the Marion Overshaw, and it ain't even close. You heard the chatter, you heard the rumors, you heard the excitement all training camp long. You asked anybody who was out at training camp, you asked anybody who watched the practice at training camp, you watched anybody who was involved in anything that had to do training camp related. Hey, who popped today? Hey, who who, who flashed today? You asked the coaches, who showed up on film today? Demar and Overshaw. 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 The kid, Overshaw. Demar and Overshaw, 13. Just flashing. Boom. You're just always popping up on film. And you got to see it on display Sunday, 3.30 in Cleveland. There was a play in, in particular that got my attention where uh, Micah it begins the pursuit of Deshaun Watson and Deshaun Watson scrambles and breaks right, looking downfield, pumping the ball, pumping the ball, trying to figure something out down the field. And all of a sudden you see this blur. This white jersey that just blurs by Micah Parsons. And that's that says a lot. That says a lot to have someone blur by Micah Parsons. And the closing speed of Overshone, where he got to Deshaun Watson and made the made the tackle for loss. So impressive. Extremely impressive. I think he ended up finishing with 11 total tackles, one sack, one tackle for loss, two quarterback hits. This kid was everywhere. And I'll even admit, when I saw and heard about him in training camp, I thought, boy, this kid has a ton of energy. He's rangy. He's wiry. But he, 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 his energy is like he's bouncing off the wall. And I'm like, boy, I hope when he gets in the game that he's able to harness. I thought he was going to be a little bit erratic. I did. I thought coming out. He was going to be a little bit erratic to start the season until he kind of found his footing. Shut up, Jesse. <laughs> Shut up. Because, boy, he was he was good. He played a good brand of football. Um, I was also – like, there was a bunch of guys that I was impressed with. The old head, the old dog, 10-year veteran. Eric Kendrick, nine tackles, two sacks, one tackle for loss, one pass uh, defense, two quarterback hits. The other old dog, D-Law, five tackles, two sacks, three tackle for losses, four quarterback hits. I told you what Marker did. And another young kid, uh, Marshawn Nealon, three tackles, one pass defense, um, and two quarterback hits. We had questions coming into this season. What would Mike, what would Mike Zimmer's defense be? Would this unit be able to ch shed the old teaching and the old ways of Dan Quinn and fully adapt and immerse themselves into the new teaching of what Mike Zim was? 
And I know it's one game. I know I get it, but it, it, it looked good. It looked really good. They did their traditional Mike Zim defense. He's going to double A gap mug those guys up in there, and you don't know who's going to come from where. You saw one play where they where, where they did the double A gap blitz, and the Browns had seven guys to protect five. I went to public school and a public university, but I can do a little bit of math. Seven to defend five means the seven guys should win. Well, this is what this is what Zim wants to do to you. He wants to be able to make the offensive linemen when they when they mug up when they when they when you see those two linebackers standing on both sides of the center, that's the a gap, left and right. When this wherever the center is set, the gap to his left, the gap to his right are the a gaps. And Zim put both of those two guys in those a gaps, and then at the snap, you don't know if they're both coming. That through those A gaps, or who's is one coming through the A gap and the other one's dropping? Are they both dropping? Uh, are you sending one through the A gap in the, in, the, in the corner? You don't know. So you try to confuse the count. They had the Browns had seven guys to block five, and they they confused them. Michael Parsons got the one on one, created the the the, the pressure. Got Deshaun Watson to uh, uh, to flood the pocket, moving to his right, right into the grasp of Tech Lawrence for a sack. It created 23 pressures on the quarterback. They had 60 total plays on offense, the, 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 um, the Browns. 23 pressures. Deshaun Watson looked erratic. He looked distressed. And that was all because of Mike Zim and his defense and the players that he put in position to succeed. The young kid on the outside, Carson, should have had two interceptions. Kind of goes back to his college days. He had a bunch of starts, a bunch of PBUs, three picks. And then I saw why. But I, I believe in you. I believe in you, Carson. I believe, and Al Harris, I trust we can get those hands right. Oh, a great welcome back from for for Trayvon Diggs with the, with the with the tip drill interception. Defenses love tip drills and overthrows. Not the Nelly type trip drill. Not that tip drill. Not that tip drill. But that, while while some of them some of them might some of them might like the Nelly tip drill. But I don't nah, not the tip drill that I'm talking about. I'm talking about. Tip drill, not tip drill. I know some of y'all partake in those activities. No judgment from me. I do not. And no, I don't want to go in there and get the wings either. But overall, this defense was the story. It's only game one. I get it. I hear it. I, I understand it. It's all I got to go off of. I don't I don't have 40 I don't have 40 games to go off of. I don't have 10 games to go off. I don't have a, a dozen games. I got one game. I got one game on record that I can go by that showed me what this defense is. And so that's how I'm going to evaluate it. Now, we'll revisit this thing 10 months from now and go this is it this this defense either continued on the surge of the way it was it continued to build and build and build and found itself at the top rankings of the defense of the league or it regressed. But as of today, where we stand today, defense showed up. Defense showed out. And the challenge will get greater and greater and greater every single week. But right now, the Zim signing looks good. And again, I know that there are a bunch of optimists over here that says, right on, Jess. And then there's the best of the, the rest of the pessimists over here that says, you know, Jess, you got a little too much dip on your chips. Slow down. It's only one game. It's just the Browns. Hey, that's all I got. That's all I got. I, I can't, I can't, I can't give you what I don't got. 
What I do have is four quarters of football against the Cleveland Browns that I can judge, that I can uh, uh, analyze, that I can break down, that I can watch. It's all I got. And from those 60 minutes, this defense looked pretty good. Looked pretty good. A lot of if that was going on in this defense after game one, less iffy for me. Now, sports, football, fluid. What's right today may not be right next week. And, and, I, and I reserve the right that if I want to change my mind next week after that performance, cool. But I'll have two games to judge by. And I'll bring those two games together and I'll 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 watch the film and I'll break it down and I'll go, huh, I like it. Or, okay, took a little step back. All I got. That's all I got to give you. So, um, but overall, I thought the Cowboys won this in every phase of the game. Shout out to uh, uh, Brandon Aubrey, Butter. I'm not going to lie. I know some of y'all, y'all wanted him to kick that 71-yard field goal. I, I get it. I wanted, I, if, the Cow, if the Cowboys were up 30, I'm all for it. They were up 17, 71 yards. You didn't have the wind in your back. You don't give up that momentum because that could be short. They, you know, you, you're doing the all burn situation, right? You, the, 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 the kick six. Now that now, now it's a 10 point game and they got crowds in it. You know, they're hyped and all that kind of stuff. They, they're believing they have a chance and things can kind of go, you know, that momentum, that pendulum swings a lot in the league. So, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that they decided to not go for the 71 yarder, but it would have been fun. And I think that there will be another opportunity, you know, preferably probably at home where there's a dome and there is no win to factor in. Uh, and then Cavante Turpin, finally, 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 my boy, you went the right direction and you got home. I'll give you an interesting fact that I saw to close out the show. The Cowboys last year opened up, I believe, against the New York football giants. The Cowboys last year offensively only had 265 total yards. They scored two offensive touchdowns. They also scored a special teams touchdown. Take a wild, wild, wild guess. Opening game this past Sunday against the Cleveland Browns. The offense. 265 total yards. They scored two offensive touchdowns and they scored a special team touchdown. It's an eerie situation. I don't know what that, what, I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. Uh, it could be 12 and five and losing the first round. It could be the, it could be the, 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 the mojo, fojo, blowjo that takes the team. I don't know. I just thought it was an interesting fact that literally on the two opening days, one year apart, that they had the same, the same exact total stat line offensively. They scored the exact same amount of offensive touchdowns, and they got a special teams touchdown. A little spooky to me. But, all right, man, that is my time. I'm tired. I, I'm tired. I had a great weekend in Chapel Hill, celebrated an absolutely tremendous event, 20-year reunion of the 2005 uh, NCAA Men's Basketball Championship. That's right. I played football and basketball. It's pretty good. I, I lived a pretty dope life. I, I cannot complain. I live a pretty, pretty dope life. And I hope that I have 40 more years of living a dope life and doing things that people only dream about doing. But I got a chance to get with the guys and what an amazing time. And then I, I you know, I stayed up two nights in a row. I'm, I'm a 930 in the bed kind of guy. I stayed up to like one, two o'clock in the morning, just shooting the breeze with the fellas, like old time. Like we were old college kids again, Friday night, Saturday night. And we didn't go out to no club or anything like that. We were just, uh, we were at the hotel that we were all staying at and just had a darn good time. Two nights in a row up late, up early for activities. And then I had to jump right on a bird, fly back to Dallas Sunday morning to get myself right for my pre and post game show. I'm tired. Got up this morning. 
Got my workout in. Your boy's tired. So uh, I'm out of here, man. Remember, you can check us out. Believe in the Cowboys and the Believe Network. All with your Spotify, all other places, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, all places where you can get your podcast from. You can hear, you can listen to me or you can look at me. Either way, I'm fine with it. But I am I am pretty, pretty easy on the eyes. So, you know, if that's your thing, sure. Have at it. But that's my time, man. I'm out of here. Hope you all have a great day, night, time, whenever you watch this. Just be great and whatever you do, man. Always remember, eliminate the contingencies. I'm out.